on behalf of the Bastia to Salamanca. Uh, I take great pleasure in welcoming you to this evening. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, let me very quickly give you an introduction to what the Bastiat Society is. Classical Liberal Society of Sri Lanka. Uh, the Bastiat Society has been functioning for almost, I would say, about 15, uh, 15 years since its inception. And we are the latest iteration uh, where the next generation has taken over. And since uh, we took over uh, at the beginning of this year. This is our second event. Uh, and what our vision and our mission is to build a community of individuals uh, who would like to discuss classical liberal ideas, uh, take forward the mission and the vision in the, uh, freedom, individuality, uh, and really contribute to the space of thinking. And that has been our vision, mission, and that's what we've been trying to do. So on behalf of the Bastiat Society, I take, I take great pleasure in, in, in welcoming all of you. And I invite you to be part of this vibrant community going forward. We have lots of events uh, planned forward, uh, from monthly discussions uh, to other community building exercises and activities. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this evening is also uh, quite special to us because uh, we have a very, apart from our kind of monthly discussions, this discussion probably stands out because uh, we have uh, a distinguished uh, panel visiting us from the Acton Institute in the United States. For those of you who are already in the liberty movement, you're already familiar with all of them. Uh, but on behalf of the Bastiat Society, we very warmly welcome uh, the Acton Institute. Uh, and, and we hope you have a pleasant stay here in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, at this talk this evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the the topic for today is markets and morality. Can they actually work? I am not going to uh, give a technical discourse because my colleague will kind of set the stage. Uh, with with that thought in mind, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Manoj Matthew, South Asian advisor and strategist, Acton Institute, uh, to to sp speak about the proceedings and invite the guest and and to introduce the uh, the guest speaker for this evening. Um, thank you, Vimanga, and thank you, Dhananath, and all the colleagues who has brought this, all of us together for this conversation. So Acton Institute is a think tank based in Grand Rapids in the Michigan state of the United States of America, and uh, you'll be delighted to see how and what we reflect as a think tank in the global space. There are over 7,000 think tanks in the, around the world. Uh, this is one of the most unique think tanks where we talk about economics, religion, and the role of markets in the world. And today's topic is very interesting, morality and the market. We discussed a lot with colleagues here why this topic is important and why Sri Lanka is the epicenter of the discussion. This reminds me about Milton Friedman's uh, four way of spending. Uh, many of you would have heard of this. Uh, the first is you about money, how we spend money. The first, what he defines is in the free to choose book is we spend our own money on ourselves. Like I buy a good trouser, good watch or something, a good mobile. I spend my money on myself. That's great. Second, I spend my money on others. I earn so I'm happy to give my wife a good gift or children what they need. We all do that. We all work and we contribute to our dear ones or we give to anybody in our neighborhood. That's great. The third way Milton Friedman mentions is that you spend somebody else's money on yourself. And this we do as professionals in the nonprofit space is a big challenge. We travel around, we know that somebody else's money we are spending on ourselves. Maybe travel, food, uh, that's where the accountability comes, the, how we do invoice, transferring. But the fourth one Milton Friedman tells us is the biggest challenge that defines Sri Lanka and many any other economy, is you take somebody else's money and spent on somebody else. You see the connection? I take money from you 
and I spent on you. That's where taxation and donations come. One, the role of the state, how the state is collecting tax and how is its accountability, accountability spending on others. And the classical example of Sri Lanka and many other economy, this has been the problem. That states were not responsible. And the same goes to the nonprofit civil society worlds that we often get donations and we spend on others. And the challenge here as civil society leaders and thinkers in this space, how can we be more transparent and accountable in the space that we practice and we do advocacy? On this note, I have the great pleasure to invite Stephen Barrows, the Chief Operating Officer of the Acton Institute. He will tell a lot about his journey and how he um, manages the Institute, followed by Michael Miller, um, a philosopher, and is the, technically is the Chief uh, Strategy Officer and the Senior Fellow at the Acton Institute. So both of us will enlighten us and take us through the journey. Thank you once again for inviting us and wish all the viewers the very best and I hope an evening of learning. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, as mentioned, my name is Stephen Barrows and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Acton Institute. Um, our mission is to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. Now, we were founded 33 years ago by a Catholic priest and Catholic layman, and, uh, and they established the institute in a you know, town called Grand Rapids, Michigan. So some of you who have gone to Acton University have been to Grand Rapids. It's a wonderful mid-sized mid uh, U.S. city. And, uh, and the, the work that we've done over the years, I think, has had a powerful impact on people across the globe. Um, I actually joined the Acton Institute four years ago as the chief operating officer. Before that, I had been an economist and, uh, and had been in the United States Air Force, uh, and then eventually came over to Acton ha after having lectured at Acton University for a number of years. So I thought before Michael gives a, a, a talk after me, I thought I'd just give you a basic overview on the kind of things that we do and the way we do approach our work. Uh, you know, at the foundation of what we do is an understanding that we have to have some original research. You know, there's a lot of very bright people in the world who do cutting edge research. We also do research as well, and we establish some of the foundations, but our goal is to take those foundations and then popularize them to a broader audience. And so whether it be in the fields of economics or moral philosophy uh, or an understanding of the proper role of government, we get that research and then we convey it to others through our conferences and other educational programs. So our most famous conference is called, as I mentioned, Acton University. Uh, this is held, it's over four days. So we uh, invite approximately 900 to 1,000 individuals from 80 different countries, and it's just a magnificent experience to be able to network with people from all over the globe. Uh, and then we have lectures, about 100 lectures over the course of four days. So in this conference, we establish core foundations to help people to think about what is it that enables some societies to flourish, and maybe what are the deficiencies that make other societies struggle. Um, so that's our flagship conference. We also have smaller seminars and conferences for about groups of this size, you know, 25 to 50 people, where you can have more intimate conversations about uh, the, the topics that we discuss. In addition to that, we have a number of uh, media productions that we do. We have podcasts that you can, of course, download at any time, Acton Online and Acton Unwind. Um, we also have documentaries. In fact, Michael Miller, my colleague here, has produced uh, two documentaries and a number of short, uh, short video projects, uh, the most famous of which is called Poverty Cure and Poverty Inc. Um, so if you haven't seen those, uh, we can make those available to you, and they have been shown at colleges and universities, film festivals, and other places across the globe. And in addition to that, our most recent documentary is called The Hong Konger, uh, that is available free on YouTube, and it's about the story of a man named Jimmy Lai, who is a 
very wealthy businessman who had all of his wealth taken away and he currently languishes in prison in Hong Kong because he stood up for doc democracy and freedom of the people in Hong Kong. So documentary and film projects, conferences and events, a research department that has a refereed academic journal that's in a number of colleges and universities across the globe. Um, and then of course, we, uh, we like to uh, make sure that we engage with people in conferences like this. So we like to get out into not only the United States, but across the globe to share our work, uh, to find others to bring into our network uh, so that we can continue to promote the ideas that encourage um, individuals to have uh, a flourishing society rooted in fr uh, free enterprise and a sound understanding of the human person and a sound moral philosophy. So that's the basic background of the Acton Institute. And again, I'm delighted to be here. It's our first time in Sri Lanka. It's just a real pleasure, and thank you so much for inviting us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Matheson Miller. I am the Chief of Strategic Initiatives at the Acton Institute, and also um, a Senior Research Fellow. So I'm delighted to be here. This also is my first time in Sri Lanka. Uh, very happy to uh, to be here, and uh, and also to be at the Avocat Institute. So, I know you just won the Templeton Prize. So, congratulations on that it's wonderful work uh, that you do. So, um, my topic today is on the connection between markets and morality. Is there a connection, markets and morality? And so, I would I would say from the beginning that absolutely there is a deep connection between markets and morality. In fact, there's an intrinsic connection between markets and morality, that markets are, in fact, moral things, or at least they should be moral things. Uh, so today I was reading, I was in India last, last week, and I was given a book about the liberal tradition in India. I read a quote this, just this afternoon about what Gandhi said, there's no separation between economics and, and ethics. And, and I think that's actually correct. Uh, so I this idea of what, when we ask about ethics and markets and morality, I think we begin uh, and and I, what I'd like to do is talk about it in two senses. First, in a sense of the intrinsic idea of how markets are, in fact, moral things. And then second, historical, especially in the West. Now, I'm going to speak about the context of the West because that's the, that's the historic, historical uh, development that, that I know. Uh, and then return back to this idea that markets are, in fact, essentially moral enterprises and that business is a moral enterprise. So I begin maybe by asking this question, like what takes place in a market? What are the things, if we start to take apart what a market is, what are the things that make up a market? So the first thing, we're going we're gonna to kind of jump around a little bit, but the first thing is a market, what's taking place in the market is exchange. So I'm going to buy something from you or sell something to you, okay? So, and then the subject of buyers and sellers are not books. The subject is not a mathematical graph. The subject is not the state. The subject of buyers and sellers are human persons. So human beings are engaged in actions. So in fact, at the Acton Institute, the first class, some of you have been to our, our, our big conference, the first lecture we do is the a vision of the person. And we, we deal with religion, so we speak about the Christian vision of the person. And, and that the person is the subject of politics and economics. And so if we think about ethics, so you have a human person, what does it mean to be a person? And then we say ethics, what is ethics? Ethics is the study of human action, the study of right and wrong, the study of how to lead a good life in order to be happy. This is ethics. And then economics is the study of human action, so ethics, in a marketplace. So fundamentally, the discipline of economics, as we know from Adam Smith, who's the founder of modern economics, comes out of moral philosophy. But let's, let's, not, let's, keep, let's go down and ask ourselves about what's taking place in a, in a market exchange. So if I decide I'm going to sell you my yellow notebook, and we make a deal on this yellow notebook. And I say, okay, I'm going to sell this to you for 1,000 rupees. And you say, okay, it's a deal. And we agree. So now you give me 
a thousand rupees and I give you the yellow notebook. All right? What's what's taking place is a couple of things. First of all, there's an there's a act of mutual benefit of trade. So if I'm going to receive a thousand rupees, you're going to receive the notebook, and it's worth it for me to give you my notebook, and worth it for you to give me the thousand rupees, and we make a deal. Okay, so there's a mutual benefit of trade. Now, but let's pause and go deeper for a second. What kind of virtue is required for this to be, for this to work well? There's two things. There's human freedom, and there's justice. So justice, and I'm going to give in the in like Aristotle, in the Western tradition, justice is to give someone their due. So an act of justice means that I give someone what is due to them. So in this exchange, it's mutually beneficial. We make an agreement. It's not coerced. And we engage in a justice of exchange. Right? In Latin, Latinate language, that's called commutative justice, the justice of exchange. So already we're in the realm of ethics because we're in the realm of justice. We're also in the realm of human freedom. Because what is going to make this transaction unjust? Okay, can you hold this for a second? Okay, thanks. So let's say I'm going to buy the yellow notebook. And I say, um, and he says, I'll, I'll, a 1,000 rupees. And I say, 800. And we, we negotiate, we go to 1,200. Okay, 1,000. And then I decide, I take a gun to his head. How about 10 rupees? And he says, 10 rupees. If I have a gun to your head, you want to sell me the notebook? Right, right, 10 rupees. Great deal. Has justice taken place? Has a mutual benefit of trade taken place? No, right? Now, what if I, he, I know his children are starving. I was like, I'll give you 20. And it's really worth 1,000. He sells it to me for 20 because, in a sense, I'm taking advantage of his situation. Again, has justice been done? So right away, at the core bottom of the simplest exchange, I'm not even yet to a market because markets are complex. Just an exchange. We're in the realm of justice and human freedom. So the dignity of the individual and giving someone their due, which means every exchange is ethical or unethical. Every exchange is moral or immoral. Okay? So what else requires me? This, so I've given this. Now let's say, for example, um, that I'm going to sell him into slavery. So I capture him and I sell him into slavery. Okay? And Manoj pays me, I don't know, a thousand US dollars for the slave. Manoj pays me a thousand dollars. I make the deal. I didn't force him. He didn't force me. I didn't put a gun to his head. Mutual benefit of trade. He got a slave. I got a thousand US. Okay? It's fine. Right? No. There's injustice being done because I have just treated a human person who is a subject like an object. Okay? So, for example, if I took this book and just kind of threw it over there, you might think that he's a little strange to throw his book over there. If I took these books and put them on the ground, you might think he's disrespectful. But if I took these three people and pushed them out the door, you'd be horrified because persons are subjects, not objects. And what I mean by that, a person is not a thing to be moved around or socially engineered by state planners or do-good charity people. Human beings are subjects. So we're seeing, once we go into these basic question of exchange, we're looking already immediately in the area of justice. I must treat a human person with dignity and respect because they're not a thing. There must be freedom. There must be no coercion. And there must be giving each other his due. All right? So that's justice. Now, in one other example, I'm going to set this down, of justice is Manoj mentioned Milton Friedman. And so we buy things. There's actually another part of justice called distributive justice in, in, in the tradition. And distributive justice 
would be, um, for example, that you could do the, the state has distributive justice, right? But I'm a father, so I have children. So I go to work and I make money and then I distribute the money to my children. All right, now I'm going to say something. That's not socialism. That's distributive justice. All right, it's very important. Now, in fact, I have a responsibility to give to my children what's And not allowing poor people to have access to commutative justice. That is, let me say it in simple terms, aid is just giving things away and not allowing people to create prosperity in their own families, in their own communities. So it looks like we care, but maybe it's an act of injustice. All right? All right, so let's, let's so we, we have this, there's obviously a lot we could do there. I'm going reasonably quickly, but we see right in the beginning of an analysis of exchange, we are in the realm of morality, human persons and justice. All right, so now let's, let's go further to the big picture, right? We ask ourselves, what's a market? What's a business? What are entrepreneurs? So we're gonna, we're gonna go from, we've zoomed in into the very micro exchange. Now we're gonna zoom out into lots of exchanges with businesses and selling and buying and what takes place for this to happen. And here too, it is in itself moral. The activities are moral because right from the beginning, there's justice. But now let's ask, what makes a market? Okay, so a market is consisted of individuals and businesses buying and selling, okay? What do you need to be able to have a market that's more than just a simple exchange on market day, but that actually allows entrepreneurs to think long-term, to invest their money, their time, their intellect in order to produce goods and services for other. Well, you need these institutions of justice. Okay, so here's a couple of them. First of all, in order for this a market to work, we need private property. Private property means that I can own something, I know it's mine, I bought it in exchange, and I have title to it, and you can't take it away from me because you're more powerful than I am. Private property. Justice and morality. You can't steal my property. Stealing. Ethics. Right? Now I have private property, and private property is very important for families because private property creates the space for families to live out their freedom and live out their responsibility. And this is why Hayek, for example, talks about how economic liberty and political liberty are connected. Because if the family can't feed themselves, then our political liberty is also gone. So there's this connection. Okay, so private property. That's a moral issue. Second, rule of law. Access to justice. So there's a multiple levels on, of justice. So 
first of all, and I'll get to this in the historical question, but let's ask a question. Justice, we've been talking about this, in the small, let's look at justice in the big. But put, I'm going to put something in your mind. Why is justice injustice? Why? Is justice, how many people think justice is better than injustice? I hope everybody, right? Why? Right. Well, we're making moral claims there. These are deep moral claims that have to do with reason and the person and a whole host of things. So justice is not better simply because it's more efficient. Because even if that were the case, I'd say, well, why is efficiency more better than non-efficiency? Okay? And sometimes efficiency is bad because it's unjust. All right? So, okay, so you have this question of justice, access to justice. So the first is just access to justice in the courts. Um, I, this is a study I read several years ago, but in, in India, there was a, one of the think tanks said it takes an average of 20 years to get your court case heard, and this is longer if you are poor, woman, a minority, right? And it's also expensive. This is not atypical throughout m many countries in the world. In fact, I have maps when I have a power show the correlation between prosperity and uh, and access to justice in the courts. So just being able to get your court case heard. As you know, back to private property, in some countries, 60% of the land has no clear title. So it's very hard to build a business if your property can be stolen from you. It's also very hard to build a business if you can't get your court case heard. And this goes to another part of justice, enforcement of contracts. So if we do the yellow notebook sale, and I buy the yellow notebook, I give him the money, he gives me the notebook. Okay, here you go, you have the notebook. I give you the money, you give me the notebook. Okay, he goes home and then he steals the notebook from me. Okay, then that injustice, right? So okay, so private property, justice, enforcement of contracts. What if I open the notebook and there are no pages? Well, he, he stole the pages before the notebook. Okay, so I can go to court and say, I want my pages, all right? Again, justice is important and then we think about this, this question of access, ability to start your business. So um, some of you probably know the work at the Bastiat Society, uh, the work and, and Avocata Institute of the work of Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist. He set up two sewing machines, shop, a little shop with two sewing machines outside of Lima, Peru. And he got student lawyers, some of you are young students around here, uh, and they went out and they had to register the business just like a poor person would. So no, they can't call as a lawyer. They can't, you know, just like a poor person. And they worked, I think, five or six hours a day. It took them 289 days. And what DeSoto explains is poor people are excluded. The legal systems are unfriendly to poor people. And that means that there's not rule of law. And this goes to the last part. Rule of law is part of justice. Well, rule of law means that the law applies equally to everyone. So whether you're rich, you're poor, whether you're a government minister or a farmer, rule of law holds. Rule of law cannot be retroactive, okay? Meaning I can't write the law today and have it apply. Oh, like I wrote the law, you know, the law today, and like two days ago you broke the law. Like, no, okay? It has to be promulgated. Everybody has to know what it is, all right? So these are, and then it has to be an act of justice, right? I can't make laws that are fundamentally unjust, all right? So I want you, I mean, if I, if I forget, remind me. I want to talk about those four things in a minute. And I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you one of the early sources of where they came from, that, those articulations, because those are not mine. I took them from somewhere, and I'll tell you where that is in a minute. Okay, so you see access to justice, enforcement of contracts, freedom of association, you need to be able to get together, to join together for something which you're competent to serve others. So what's a business? A business is a community of persons where people get together to meet their needs, to feed their families. How? By producing goods and services that serve other people. But again, we're in the realm of justice. I can't sell things that are immoral, and I can't steal, and I have to tell the truth, and I can't break justice. Okay? And then free exchange. And free exchange, we've already kind of seen, but, you know, in Kenya, sorry, in Kenya, at one point, coffee farmers had to have to sell their coffee to the government board. So they can't sell it to the market. They have to sell it to somebody else, 
by force, who then sells it to the market and makes money on arbitrage. So poor people are excluded. And then why is it the case that a coffee farmer who works the land, who has private property, if they have it, why do they have to forcefully sell it to somebody else at a set price, right? That's not just. So already we see if we, the whole concept of it, not only individual exchange, but markets are deeply moral issues. And they're rooted in the dignity of the human person, in human freedom, and that justice is better than injustice. Right? And these claims matter, okay? Now, I'm going to go very quickly in the next part because we're almost done. But I want to say that historically, these ideas also come out of deep moral and, in fact, religious traditions in the West, okay? And in, obviously, not just the West because the first deepest source of these ideas is in the Hebrew Bible, which is not Western. Okay, so this is not a, 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 the Hebrew Bible is not a Western text. Okay, uh, it deeply influences the West, but the text itself is obviously it, it's it's uh, not not like this is not out of England. Okay, <laughs> these ideas did not come out of England. All right, so let me just give a couple of examples. I talked about private property. Well, in Genesis twenty three, Abraham buys a plot of land for his wife's burial for his wife Sarah's burial, and he pays money. And they say, we'll give it to you. He says, no, I want to pay for it, and I want title. He doesn't kill them for it, and he doesn't take it as charity. He pays for it. So you see already trade in Genesis, the first book of the Hebrew Bible. You see it in Exodus 22, thou shalt not steal. Okay? You see it in, uh, second, I think it's 2 Samuel 12 or 1 Samuel 12, um, and where David, after a census, sorry, he commits it, he has a census, and he's punished by God with the plague, and he goes to offer sacrifice, and the man, Aruna the Jebusite, where the plague stops, says, well, I'll give you my, my animals for, for sacrifice, and he says, no, I have to buy it first, so private property is throughout that, and it keeps going, you see it through the New Testament, you see it through the Church fathers, you see it coming in through various sources of Roman law and other places. But you see it in Thomas Aquinas, who, following Aristotle, makes a whole argument. So Thomas Aquinas is a very famous medieval theologian, 1200s, making the arguments for private property. Okay? So I could go on how, but it comes out of a tradition. Same thing with justice. Leviticus 19.16 says... This is early in the Hebrew Bible. He says, you shall, there, shall be no Im, there shall be no partiality in justice. You treat rich people the same and poor people the same. And this, again, goes through, et cetera. Now, remember when I gave you those four things about what's rule of law? Promulgated, just, applies to everybody, uh, can't be retroactive. That's actually from Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica in the 1200s. So this is, these are, moral arguments. It's free association, I talked about. Is people get together. Thomas Aquinas, again, he's not the only one, but I'm giving you examples because it's just like 1,200. Right? You see it earlier in St. Augustine and others. But Thomas Aquinas makes the same case. He says, people have a right to join together with their competent. And the funny thing is this. Thomas was a, was a priest of the Dominican order, and the bishops said, you can't have universities. He said, yes, we can, because we we're human beings with a right of association because we have a social nature, and you can't stop us be, if we're competent to do something for the common good. And in fact, later, hundreds of years later, uh, one of the popes made this very argument of why there's the rights to unions and why there's rights to businesses. So these are deep in the religious tradition, and then free exchange, the same thing. There's a wonderful book, if you're interested, a couple, uh, Robert Lopez, Cambridge University Press, wrote a book called The Medieval Commercial Revolution from 800 to, I think, 1300 to 1400. Harold Berman has a book called Law and Revolution, where the development of joint ventures and limited liability, and all of these come out of deeply religious, moral ideas about the human person. So the point I want to make here is that markets and morality are not separate, but markets must be moral. Markets are moral. Business is moral.
And we should judge business not, on, not only on efficiency, but on its morality. And this is why, now do I mean that businesses are always moral? Of course not. Businesses do immoral things all the time. That's not what I'm arguing, okay? What I'm arguing is that market economies and free exchange are fundamentally moral institutions that affirm the dignity of the human person, human freedom, and the practice of justice. And so I think, in fact, the last thing I'll say is one of the ways that we can think about markets and make arguments for markets is to go into these moral aspects. Because too often, people who support mar free markets like I do, we're, we always are making efficiency arguments, okay? But sometimes efficiency is unjust. Or sometimes efficiency doesn't, it doesn't have a rich appeal. And then it can also lead us to make errors. And so I think to think about markets from a moral perspective and also be confident that we take justice seriously. Those of us who support free competitive market economies take justice seriously. It doesn't mean every market or business is just. Absolutely not. And that's how we can judge it. But deeply in itself, these are human moral actions. And this is why they're so important for families and they're so important for poor people to have access so they can create prosperity in their own families and communities. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you to Avocata Institute and Bastiat Society. I'm honored to speak to you today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think now we are going to uh, the, the crux of today's discussion, which will be the discussion. Uh, so I very warmly invite, uh, uh, I very uh, warmly invite our guests, uh, our speakers for this evening. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Burrows. We have uh, Michael Miller. Uh, so the, I invite you to join the floor. Uh, we have Mr. Rohan Masakurala, uh, and I invite my colleague uh, Shinali, who will be moderating this evening's ses uh, session. Uh, very quickly, until the mics have, are being set, uh, let me very quickly give you uh, uh, an introduction uh, to our speakers. Uh, I believe uh, Manoj gave a very uh, basic introduction. But let me very quickly, for context, uh, take you through uh, who the speakers are. So we have uh, Dr. Stephen Burrows, uh, who's the Chief Operating Officer at the Acton Institute. Uh, prior to his role at the Acton Institute, Dr. Burrows served as the Executive Vice President, Provost, and Dean of the Faculty of Aquinas College, uh, Grand Rapids, where he taught, where he also tenured as an Associate Professor of Economics. Uh, his, his biography goes, goes on and on. But very simply, uh, he also served 21 years in the Air Force uh, as an acquisitions officer and uh, also as the economics professor at the United States Air Force Academy. Uh, so very, 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 very warmly welcome you here. We have uh, Michael Matheson Miller, uh, Chief of Strategic Initiatives and Senior Research Fellow at the Acton Institute. He's a director and producer of the award-winning documentary series, Power to Incorporation, which uh, is not new for us. Uh, He's the host of the Moral Imagination podcast and a distinguished fellow at the Bacow School of Business at the Catholic University of America and the author of Digital Contagnation and the Forthcoming Excluded. Uh, his biography goes on and on. Uh, we will be sharing uh, these, these biographies uh, on, 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 our, on our social media sites. And... Uh, we, of course, have uh, representing uh, Sri Lanka and the Viv here, uh, Mr. Rohan Masakorala, who's, who's uh, not new to us, who's uh, a friend of Advocata and the Bastiat Society. Uh, Mr. Masakorala uh, is an honors graduate in economics uh, with a second major in business administration and marketing from uh, the Connecticut State University. Uh, and he has a diploma in business management from the Houston University, Texas in supply chain management and supply chain management from the Cranefield University, UK. He counts 30 years of experience uh, in, in, in a range of sectors. He's the founder member of the Shippers Academy, as well as the CEO of Shippers Academy Colombo and the Shippers Academy International Australia. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and this evening session will be moderated uh, by my colleague Shanali. Uh, she's an analyst at Learn uh, at LearnAsia, and she's also uh, the the head of uh, outreach and advocacy for the Bastiat Society. Uh, Shanali, over to you. Thanks, Vimank. So whether it's morality that guides our markets or self-interest, which is enlightened or otherwise, it's very important to sort of <laughs> um, not lose sight of what all of this means in a very practical sense. And we need to understand how these ideas actually affect real people. So on that note, Mr. Masakurala, would you be able to set this for us and sort of go into the current economic situation in Sri Lanka and the policies that kind of brought us here and the effect it has on people. I think, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, so, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, when I was invited for this discussion, I accepted immediately because markets, morality, and ethics have been part of my battle in Sri Lanka. Um, as she mentioned that uh, Sri Lanka was a, a so-called market economy since 1977. Uh, in my mind, I have seen it going up coming do down and crashing. So today we have a crashed market economy or we are bankrupt in state of economics. Uh, and uh, the reason behind this is very simple. We have lost what is called fairness in the market. We talk about justice, justice comes, fairness is the key word for, I guess when you put it into the books, it's become justice, but in human terms, to be fairness against another human being. So as a society, as, a, as administrative structures, Sri Lanka has gradually uh, de demoted itself in terms of standards of those fairness. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the political elements have got into the market, uh, which started controlling the market. So actually we probably, in my opinion, last 20 years, the market itself, of the market we talk of itself is distorted. That distortion brought in uh, very clearly what we call bad economic management. That led to the collapse today. So we are reaping simply bad economics bad morality in terms of governance in this country uh, and uh, end result as a society we are witnessing it today and the damage it has done to us in my opinion we have gone back 20 years as a society minimum 20 years and i see it even more danger out coming out of it is the social values are eroding with it what is already existing, what we have built for years or as, as, as a culture. I mean, the, the topic would be even more nice to say markets, culture, and morality. We have had our own culture for thousands of years, and we, we always expect the next generation to build it up to a higher level. So what I have seen in the modern market economy in Sri Lanka since 1977 is we've gone to a uh, exchange market, uh, had successes, had failures, uh, but lately we've re put on the reverse gear and collapsed. So from here onwards, it's a tough, tough task for us because it's, it's not in my hands, not at my age, but the next generation needs to understand to build this country back again on that moral values. If we don't build those moral values of society, uh, markets will keep on failing. 
that is what happens. I mean, I, I followed uh, President Mick Romney talking about uh, in the 2012 uh, presidential candidate, Mick Romney, and before that, uh, Barack Obama talking about the regu strong regulatory framework with rule of law that is needed for a market to succeed. And our own uh, judge, CJ Viramantri Late, who was vice president of the International uh, Court of Justice, once in Colombo at the Ceylon Chamber, uh, very clearly made a statement in terms of uh, market exchanges. He said, uh, when bargaining powers are not equal in the international marketplace, that is where the government should intervene for fair play. So we have had these structures discussed, all that, but sadly, last 10, 15 years, we've completely lost that morale factor in the governance of a country. That is where we crashed. Rest of it is all economics. Uh, Mr. Barrows, would you like to comment on uh, what Mr. Masakura said? We would particularly be interested to sort of understand the human dignity, how it has been affected due to the aspects that Mr. Masakura spoke about. Certainly. Oh, it sounds like mine's working. Is it working okay? Yeah, yeah. All right, good. Well, yes, you know, the, the particular circumstances um, I am not familiar with in Sri Lanka. Of course, I've read some about the recent troubles, you know, inflation, contracting economies, uh, the departure of individuals seeking el opportunity elsewhere. And it's really um, a shame to see that when you have a situation where people in positions of power don't treat people equally, or they make use of their position of power uh, for corrupt purposes, or um, an example that happened in the United States, uh, when we had our temporary crash back in 2008, 2009, you can go back and trace to bad ideas, um, in unequal application of the law, special treatment of individuals that cause a great redistribution of wealth and a harming of mostly of the poor. So let me give you an example just in the United States and how this really negatively impacts people. You ended up having um, excessive leverage during the financial uh, buildup in the 2000s, very low interest rates, and risky financial investments that were made on behalf of, of uh, investment banking groups. When it became clear that this wasn't sustainable, the Federal Reserve and Congress bailed out the big financial corporations. Okay, at the same time, at the same time, there were thousands of individuals who had been purchasing homes with very murky circumstances about what would their interest rate was, how it would change over time, that it would be okay if they didn't have a down payment, that everything would be fine, and then they lost their homes. Now, did those individuals get bailed out? Well, no, because they didn't have a voice, right? And they didn't have the power. They didn't there wasn't this systemic risk if you let people lose their homes as there was if you bailed out the big corporations. So here's an example where you apply the circumstances differently depending on people's wealth, power, access to politicians and so forth. And so although you know, thankfully the United States has largely recovered, the risks still remain. If you don't correct the underlying misapplication of the law or the underlying moral hazard that you create in these kinds of situations, or if you have only well-connected businessmen to politicians being the ones that can get out of a jam, right, so to speak, you're not going to have a flourishing society in the long run. Now, in the United States, we're very privileged. We have the world's reserve currency, okay? We are able to um, be assured in the short run that people aren't going to lose confidence in the United States, but that's never a long-run guarantee, right? If we start to have our fundamental values okay, change, where people start looking at the United States and say, you know, the United States, they kind of have cronyism. You know, their government spends way, way more than it ever brings in in taxes. They misapply the law. They give special privileges to the wealthy and, and don't treat people equally. If, if the world starts to lose confidence in the United States, we could lose much of what we have, and the same risks of economics that we see happen to other countries could also apply to the United States. So in Sri Lanka's situation, it's very sad to see. And what you need is those underlying principles of morality, equal application of, of law, as Michael Miller had mentioned, because if you don't have those positions in place, you're gonna have 
uh, you're going to have a lot of harm. Well, one last quick thing, and this probably is more applicable to Sri Lanka. Investment. Investment, that is, people who have surplus funds, savings, and they're seeking to find places to put their resources to grow an economy. People only invest when they're confident that there's going to be just rule of law, that there's going to be if they're uncertain about that, they're going to look elsewhere. Okay? And if they look elsewhere, you won't have access to capital that so often helps societies grow in the long term. You know, Michael has mentioned down the road, you know, seeing not term exchange, but a market that continues to grow and flourish. That but in an unstable uh, economic and political environment or an equal application of the law, um, you end up question is for you. Um, so in the current context, we know that the IMF has offered a package to Sri Lanka to bail it out of this current crisis. Um, and we know that there is some emphasis on safety nets in the package. Because right? so it's there to humanize the package and, you know, it's just a rhetorical trick. Um, or, or it's the morally and economically correct thing to do because one of Sri Lanka's greatest assets are its people. And we want to prevent a stunted population, right? So if you think of helping people going through a crisis in a very focused, time-limited way that doesn't um, distort market incentives, is there an enlightened self-interest to act in a moral way? enlightened self-interest to act in a uh, moral way here. And how do you like help these people who are falling through the cracks? Is it working now? Okay. Okay. Um, th can you hear me? No. Try that one. There we go. Okay. Um, so, I the question the question is, um, you know, thinking about the response to the crisis in in Sri Lanka um, and the social safety net and how to think about this question uh, and also in light of self interest. So, I don't know enough to speak about the specifics of Sri Lanka crisis, so I, I can't speak about that uh, with any intelligence. Um, there's a disease, you know, that you get when you get a microphone. It's called expertitis, and so you think that you're an expert on everything. Uh, so I, I, I'm trying to avoid, I have no expertitis here, uh, at least I hope not, too much. Um, so, but I think what we, but I think on principle, the, the way to think about foreign aid assistance with IMF or World Bank or, or other uh, like bilateral aid is there absolutely is a place for crisis assistance and, and, and for social safety nets. I think this is, this is the case. So that, so that let me say in 
when there's a natural disaster, or in this case, an economic uh, crash, but when there's a natural disaster, you need immediate humanitarian assistance or you need social safety net immediately. And the key, I think, is to, is to address it as, as a crisis and the way we help ourselves and our others and our family and our community in crisis is it's a short-term injection of, say, food or whatever it might be to help people get back to where they need to be. But we don't treat it, we don't use the, we don't use the crisis as the model for economic development. And I think that's one of the problems you've seen, especially in the foreign aid industry, is that we tend to, we tend to see the problems as a, as a emergency or a crisis, when in fact many of the problems are chronic. And so we apply emergency crisis responses to chronic problems. Uh, and so I think, the, again, I can't speak about the specifics of Sri Lanka, but I would say that the plan should be somewhere, and this takes prudence and community participation. You can't, it, a, a tech cannot decide this on his or her, or her own. Right? You can't just have like some experts in the, in the IMF and the World Bank are like, oh, here, we'll just socially engineer everything. It always goes wrong. And this, again, I mentioned before, this is the great insight of, of Hayek, of not the problem of knowledge and decisions. Right? There's just not enough. So it has to be participatory. But I think in sum, that it has to be short, focused, and, um, and participatory. And the goal needs to be to help create as, as, as Professor said here, these fundamental elements of fairness and justice so that people then can create prosperity in their own families, in their own communities, and that so Sri Lanka can establish its own social safety net when needed for those people who cannot you know, be helped by, by other community and civil society organizations. Do you mind if I add one thing? Because you said my ear perked up. Shanali said that, I'm going to paraphrase, that, that people are Sri Lanka's most important resource. And I give a talk on that, and it's so true. Um, too often, we, we, uh, individuals think of people as mere mouths to feed, okay? But people are actually first and foremost minds that create, right? We're, we're co-creators. We actually think of ways to solve problems, and oftentimes the things that we need to be thinking about, the short-term crisis is really important, provide that immediate assistance because it's necessary. But then ask the long run question, how can we create a situation where individuals can use their minds, their gifts and talents to serve others so that they can be prosperous, as Michael said. So yes, I love that you said that. People are your most important. Thank you, Mr. Barrows and Mr. Miller. Um, so we have a couple of minutes before we let the audience kind of ask their questions. So. Um, before we go into that, I'll just pose a question for you, Mr. Mascorala. Um, another thing that people think of when we speak of morality, uh, maybe the concepts of ESG, CSR, right, uh, which continue to sort of gain popularity. On one side, uh, the mandate of a corporation is to follow the market imperative and you know, maximize their profits while also, of course, um, following the law. However, in of distributive justice, do companies also have a duty to society? And if you think that's the case, how do you know and who decides what's good for society? Indeed, uh, corporates do have a great responsibility to the society. Uh, and this is where actually we also must go in front of the mirror and look at in Sri Lanka whether actually whether they have that responsibility towards justice to the society, because what I see is large of also have um, links into the political system country, which happened uh, not over a decade but many decades. Uh, it becomes uh, it becomes some kind of a deal rather than a responsibility to the society. Uh, I look at most uh, CSR projects, what I see is uh, they are more towards uh, image building of the company rather than actually a social responsibility. Because uh, that is quite evident with the way they market it. 
uh, you can see that there's competition kind of a company that this big company wants who's doing the same thing wants to do something rather than it coming genuinely out of uh, the society's needs so yes to answer your question shortly yes that certainly the corporates have the bigger responsibility in my opinion uh, who controls the economy uh, in a large way the market economy uh, so their moral values their ethical standards their fairness and justice to the market is critical for the market to succeed and in sri also the courts justice take years to clear a case that is the standard 15 to 15 years so obviously the same issues that michael brought up when the justice system is so weak the market economy cannot stand stall and that is where the also look at. Uh, and that is why we have been suffering on investments for if you look at large it's versus the region. Thank you. May I add one, just one addition? I, I completely agree with your, your analysis. I think it's very important. Um, oftentimes, corporate social responsibility, as, as, as Professor said here, ends up being, I'm going to sponsor something that's politically fashionable or that's popular or that makes me look cool, right? right? And, but the real corporates, so, and so sometimes free marketers tend to say, though, though the corporate social responsibility is just to make a profit. But I think it's more than that. I think it's to follow the law. I mean, of course, Milt Friedman said it was to follow the law. But, but to, um, for example, we talked about justice earlier. Um, I would say to not take subsidies and special arrangements from the government, to not, to not create barriers to entry that allow, that prevent entrepreneurs from coming in, um, to not pollute, uh, to not sell evil things, to not engage in advertising that degrades women or corrupts children. These are social moral responsibilities of the government, and I mean, sorry, of, the, of corporations. And I, of course, your point about justice is, of, without a strong judicial framework, then it's even more responsible. But many times, corporations come, uh, whether from abroad or local, in different countries. Again, I don't know the Sri Lankan situation, but they pollute, they sell evil things, they do advertising that corrupts children, uh, they, they, they skirt around the law, they get special deals from the minister, okay? And then their corporate responsibility is to do things for which they have either no competence and creates the agency problem, or politically fashionable things that oftentimes undermine moral life. So I, I completely agree that the corporate social responsibility is like a, it's almost like a transaction cost, like a bribe, right? So like in many countries, you have to bribe somebody in order to get something done. In the United States, corporate social, social responsibility is you have to bribe interest groups to leave you alone. Meanwhile, you can get special things from the government. So I think it's a scam and super harmful, and it undermines the morality of business and the morality of the market. Thanks, Mr. Miller. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we'll open up the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, I'd like to first make a comment and then Rohan, I just want to take you up on the last 15, 20 years. I think since uh, raped this country uh, and then we opened the economy after what went in socialism. Uh, we were ahead, we were the first country that had a hybrid model because we had welfare, so we ended up second only to Japan in quality of life index, free education, free health, while we were the first country in Asia to open up our markets. Uh, but my question now is, uh, more importantly, is part of the problem, though you said that it's when crony cap uh, cronyism comes in, that's the problem. Cronyism is an of capitalism and the asymmetry of markets, because capitalism and democracy in a combination tends to 
allow the, uh, the stronger to survive and there is a natural asymmetry. So is there some other model which doesn't, which allows for some de a degree of social equity which moves away from this? And as a point of irony, I wouldn't hold the US as being the model bastion of anything. Uh, interestingly, I think the uh, Declaration of Rights was initially drafted as life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Mm. Eventually, some hack decided the pursuit of happiness would sound better. <laughs> but it's ironic. So yes, thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll just give her a few thoughts and then maybe have pass it on to the other panelists for their thoughts. So, you know, it's difficult sometimes to know how to distinguish between cronyism and just plain representative government, okay? So in the United States, we have a representative government and individuals have a right to petition their elected officials and vote for elected officials and make their desires, their goals, their interests heard. Um, and then it can become unfortunately driven by powerful moneyed interests where then you have lobbying and then the loudest and wealthiest can get their voices heard most. It becomes outright corruption, of course, when there's bribery and other things that are happening between those who are creating and passing and executing the laws and then the business or interest groups that are seeking to have those laws uh, shaped in their favor. Um, so cronyism is oftentimes, as Michael said, taking your position, lobbying, not so much for just laws, but lobbying to put out your competition and to make special favors for yourself. And that's where I think now, getting to the rest of your question, is there another model? Well, I think one thing we haven't quite addressed as much in this discussion that is vital is the role of civil associations okay, in a society. Um, society is not simply the division between state and market. Society has churches, civil associations, recreational groups, sports teams, schools, et cetera, so many of the activities that make for a good life um, in a flourishing society should be done by those you know, smaller groups, families, churches, synagogues, or what have you. Um, and so if, and to the extent we can emphasize and remind that the state needs to protect those aspects of society, and then the market needs to not damage them, but to provide a specific function of, of goods and services to the marketplace, I think that will help. So that's one key aspect I think we have kind of overlooked here in this conversation. It's not simply state or market or certain types of capitalism or you know, democratic capitalism, but there's this other element that's vital for the society. Michael, you want to say? Yeah, so uh, I don't disagree with you that uh, we are, it's a fact that we were colonized. Now that's what under the bridge, whatever we do, we have to accept it happened. Uh, good, bad, ugly, everything happened within that. And it's not only to Sri Lanka. You look at Singapore, it was also colonized. Hong Kong was also colonized. But today Singapore's per capita income is $80,000. They live a life of what we should have been living. So there is a management problem here, right? That's what the latest, what you talked about IMF, National Rating Agencies very clearly said, mismanagement. So that was nothing to do with colonization. It's modernization after Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew came in with a set of rules, rules-based governance, right? It's, Sri Lanka talks a lot about, we, I, talk, I started the Singapore Shippers Academy with them a long time ago. There is a system of governance, accountability, traceability, trackability. My other country, adopted country, Australia. Citizens have rights. Citizens talk of their rights in the market. You just cannot manipulate the market. It will be in the parliament next day and it will be taken very seriously. Now here we, you look at the news here. These two gentlemen won't know that. You know what, what it is. Are we progressively going towards at least where we were 20 years, 30 years ago in parliament. The gentleman speaking in proper language, morality comes from language, the behavior, the culture, all that is missing here. So that is where the problem, the market is completely mismatched with morality here in Sri Lanka now, right now. And that is why we have a crashed economy. Only economy that has crashed in whole of Asia. 
we have to look at ourselves particularly at ourselves and then look at good governance in similar countries that had colonialism brought in free economy democracy there are success stories there is no 100% uh, foolproof systems but uh, definitely we are at the bottom of that ladder sadly so we need to start climbing it away and that's business is ours sri lankans It's one country where if you have to pay your citizens to date people and get along and marry and have babies. If you've lived and worked there long enough, and I think you have, you would have seen the unhappiness. They have over a million insomniacs. Fail state too, in many ways. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear? Can I? Can this work? Okay. So, um, thank you for your comment. No. Thank you for your your comments and question. I think it's a very important one because we're dealing with multiple areas, and I think this is partially why I'm distant. As I said in my talk, we cannot separate thinking about economics from moral questions and from justice. Nor can we separate thinking about the human person. I'm glad you added culture because we also, I mean, I was talking for 20 minutes, not, you know, we also have to think about what does a good life look like? What does human flourishing look like? What does family life look like? And why these things matter? And and so what we're what we're seeing, uh, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot we could, we could talk about. Um, uh, and I think one, th so let me just mention a couple of things. I cannot, there's no way I could try to do justice to your serious question in this short time. So I, I'm going to ask your forgiveness because I will leave things out simply because of, of time, uh, because it's so many things going on. But I would say um, that historically we do see that when there's rule of law, which is actually more important for human social flourishing than democracy, rule of law, right? Because just as you said, you can have authoritarian problems, you can have quote unquote democracies that are totally corrupt with no rule of law and poor and the minorities are excluded. So a tyranny of the majority, right, is a democracy without rule of law. So you have, so rule of law really matters. I'm not saying participation does not matter. I'm saying, Rule of law and participation have to be balanced because if you only have participation, you create a tyranny party. So rule of law, and again, this is why justice is so important. Second of all, um, I think with the hybrid economics, I mean, all, in one sense, every economy is hybrid, okay, the, the, right? So the question is how much hybrid? Right now, the average in the European United States is about 40% of GDP is government. Um, it's, it's too hybrid, it's too big, right? And regulations, and this is another thing, when an economy gets highly regulated, who writes the regulations? Big corporations, powerful interest groups, entrenched bureaucracy. So the poor and the small business owners, women, minorities, lack the economic context to navigate this system. So they get excluded even worse. So part of the question of, of, of equity and equality is there's always going to be some equality, for sure. So we have to make sure that the equality is not the result of injustice, right? And so too often, injustice takes place. Uh, with that, so we have to take these very seriously. Stephen mentioned the role of civil One of the problems we have, especially in the West, but I think it's a global problem, and the great French philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville, I think, is a guide here. Not just Bastiat, uh, but also Tocqueville. Uh, that individualism leads to centralization. And centralization encourages individualism. So oftentimes, the centralizing state and capitalists have aligned together for both long-term and short-term interests to encourage individualism and break apart civil associations, weaken the family, weaken the church, weaken interest groups. And this means that you have little tiny individuals against a massive state. And when that comes in, not only can you not resist the state, you cannot resist.
some of the evils and social negatives that come from business. And so if you notice, I think business is a moral enterprise, but I don't want to defend businesses. I want to defend free competitive market economies grounded in justice that give poor people access. Now, this goes to the last point or the two points I want to make. One is those, this will never solve the problems of evil, sin, suffering, and death. Because I do not believe there is a technical solution to the problems of evil, sin, suffering, and death. There will always be evil. There will always be sin. There will always be suffering. There will always be death. And so our goal is to create a perfect society, but to create as possible a relatively just society. Every time we get a promise of a perfect society, millions of people are dead. Every time. Right? And we're disappointed and enslaved. And so we're always comparing relatively just elements. I don't mean justice is relative. I mean we're comparing plausible alternatives. And so I think as free marketers, we have to admit markets will not save you. Markets do not solve all the problems. Markets must be embedded in a deep understanding of justice, human flourishing, the family, society, civil society, the common good. And markets have to serve that not just simply be the, the most important. And then the last thing I want to say is this. I'm sorry I'm going a little long. There's a great Italian philosopher. His name is Augusto Del Noce. And Del Noce said something that's very important, that's pervasive not only in the West, but throughout the world. He said that we, and this is, this is specifically to the West, so you can apply it to Sri Lanka. I'm going to tell you how it is in the West, and you can apply it to Sri Lanka. He said we shifted from a Christian bourgeois, that is, economics grounded in a whole complex system of human flourishing and life and purpose and meaning and family and civil society and right and wrong to pure bourgeois where everything becomes a transaction. He said the hippie became a yuppie. Everything is a transaction. And so now we sell babies, we sell wombs, we sell sperm, we sell absolutely everything and anyone and anybody. And when we live in a, when, when, when pure bourgeois, when pure market transactions take over, this harms human freedom and harms justice and harms society and ultimately can never sustain a market economy because a market economy, in order for it to be work, must be grounded in justice. But transactional pure bourgeois rejects justice because it's not something empirical or transactional. So your questions open up really deep issues. It's very important that we keep in mind markets in the context of justice. Sorry for my long answer. Yeah. Um, so now we'll go into uh, brief closing remarks from each one of you. Thank you. I don't, I don't think I have a lot to add, but for me, uh, the whole conversation about humanity and us, the key word here is whatever we come and talk about is among millions and billions of people, we are trying to build societies that can bring prosperity to each and every one of us in some way or the other than what was yesterday than tomorrow. And we want through some kind of fair, the free market gives that opportunity provided, which I thoroughly agree, is rule of law and justice. If these two elements are missing in the free market, uh, it tends to be a monster. That's how I see it. Thank you. Yes, I'd just like to close to say it's been the mission of the Acton Institute for 33 years to show the interdependence of markets and morality. Uh, it's best for the human person. It's best for a flourishing society. And you must have both in order to ensure that individuals are treated with the dignity and have the hope that we all want. So thank you. Yes. And I would just like to say thank you uh, for inviting us to the Bastiat Society and to the Advocate Institute. It's a delight and honor to be here. And I, I'm really uh, grateful uh, for this opportunity to discuss these very important things. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Vimanga for concluding remarks. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, very quickly, I thank uh, the panel, Mr. Masakurala, Mr. Masakurala uh, 
Dr. Miller, uh, Mrs. Uh, Doctor, uh, sorry, Dr. Stephen, um, Mr. Michael Miller, uh, and Shanali for the fantastic discussion you put on show today, and for the discussion, uh, we're extremely honoured as the Bastiat Society uh, to have hosted this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're just heading on. Uh, we're also running short of time, so we're just closing uh, today's uh, our discussion. But before that. I will also take this as an opportunity to thank uh, all of you uh, and also just tell you that do stay in touch with the Bastiat Society. We have a lot of events planned going forward. Uh, and I also thank uh, the entire team behind this uh, event. Uh, there was a uh, lot of people uh, volunteering and helping out uh, with, with the whole team. We are also launching our website very soon. So you can see who's behind the Bastiat Society and who's the team running uh, running operations. So all that will be out, so, uh, so do uh, keep a tab. Uh, to do the closing remarks, I, I invite uh, Mr. Dananath Fernando, Chief Executive Officer at Vakata, uh, to do the closing remarks for, for the evening. Thank you very much. I think a good example is when the microphone decides to function it in its own, and sometimes the radio signal drops, you can see how even a market can fail. But I think it also shows when you have the correct morality that still the purpose can be achieved. And this gentleman and the lady did a fantastic job on uh, explaining and cracking insights uh, on markets and morality. So for which we are deeply, deeply grateful. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Maskorala, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, and uh, Michael uh, for for joining and coming all the way from the US uh, and extending your trip from India to here. And thank you, Shenali, and we are delighted. And all the very best for the Bastia chapter and the President Vimanga and his team, dynamic team behind it. Uh, and thank you, Manoj, for, I think, connecting us together because these conversations are quite important. As Advokara, what we do is a lot of research, evidence-based research to shape the policy narrative of Sri Lanka. But the, 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 the philosophical discussion needs to take place because that's where it stems from, because it's based on principles, values, and we all work for a better cause on shaping Sri Lanka's uh, direction. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, a special thank to Vimanga and Devin, uh, who is behind uh, all of these organize, uh, organizing this wonderful event. And I think we also should thank the Lakmahal Community Library uh, for allowing us to have this conversation. And Advocata is always happy to uh, get connected. And I, I, I uh, personally have been to the Acton University. I think our colleague Katsarani have been there. And it's a wonderful program uh, to really understand the principles, because it's all at one point drills down to the principle what we believe before we drafting the policy. Because as it said, uh, statistics without principles and principles without statistics both are quite dangerous. So it's important that we go hand in hand. We put a lot of effort on understanding the data-driven approach, but at the same time to understand the principles and thanks. And we are very happy that the Bastiat Society is there now to take this conversation forward because we are more on the policy side, uh, understanding, dealing, uh, drilling to, through the data. So it's already 8 o'clock. I'm not going to take any more time. Thank you very much. We deeply, uh, I enjoyed the conversation. Excellent insights uh, from and from a more philosophical uh, standpoint. So thank you very much. And I hope everyone also had a pleasant evening. Hopefully, the next time the microphones and the radio signals will work better so uh, you can have a better connection. But they did a fantastic justice on digging uh, deeper into the topic. Thank you very much.